Hello, my dog lovers. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, Alicia, are you there? Hi, good morning. I am not seeing you for some reason. I am not seeing you. Alicia, we are missing you. <laughs> Maybe we're not. I am not seeing the screen here. I really apologize to you guys today because we had major technical difficulties and challenges. And um, it looks like um, we are running on two systems right now. We are running on um, one which is uh, not broadcasting and then on Zoom. And Alicia, I need you to be on Zoom. Otherwise, we will not be able to see you. Alicia, I need you to be on Zoom. Otherwise, we will not be able to see you. And Zoom the, uh, and mute the other microphone on Riverside. Thank you. All right. So <laughs> anyway, um, now I see Alicia. That's great. Um, you guys, we've had major, major challenges, and I really apologize for the delay, but we have really amazing material today for you to be able to share some important info on how to prevent diabetes and how to treat it if your dog, unfortunately, has been diagnosed with diabetes. So um, where do we start? How about if we share a screen? I need to reground because uh, it has been <laughs> really interesting 15 minutes of trying to get in. Um, so diabetes, um, I'd like to take a few moments to give you a little better understanding of diabetes because many of you probably have a lot of knowledge and information on, on this condition and some of you don't. So number one, it is a hormonal condition, meaning that insulin that is deficient mostly in diabetes in dogs, and I'll explain that why I'm saying mostly, is a hormone. So insulin is a hormone. Second, it is a disease of pancreas. Diabetes is basically related to the function of pancreas that produces insulin. And if pancreas doesn't produce enough insulin in dogs, then it turns into diabetes. Now, this is diabetes type 1 when there is not enough of insulin. Diabetes type two is actually more common in people. It's almost uh, unheard of in dogs. Therefore, we'll be paying attention to the type one diabetes, just to kind of clarify that. Now, diabetes in many situations is an autoimmune problem where the body actually, um, the body's immune system falters or malfunctions and it attacks the pancreatic cells that stops produce, stop producing insulin. Um, the lack of response to insulin, as I said, is type two, and that is not very common in dogs. And we are going to be talking about type one. So, you know, when I was preparing for this little session, I run into this little chart. And uh, this little chart says that type one diabetes cannot be prevented. And I crossed it over because I do not think that that is correct. Um, it actually can be prevented. And you learn in the course of this hour, how it can be prevented and what it can do. And that genetic predisposition to diabetes is actually not necessarily um, something that, that will cause eventually diabetes because genes, are responsible for about 15 to 20% of all of their expression. The rest is the environment and diet and stress and other components or factors. So um, just a reminder for everyone, pancreas is a gland that is quite close to the, it's in the front portion of the abdomen and it's very close to the stomach. It produces digestive enzymes, but also produces some hormones, including insulin. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what insulin does and what it doesn't do. So it's produced in pancreas and then it's released in, um, in the bloodstream. And when it circulates in the bloodstream, it actually creates a very, it, it has a very important function. It allows the blood sugar enter cells. So 
the reason why we have a lot of glucose or blood sugar in diabetic dogs or people in the bloodstream is that the, the sugar, the glucose cannot enter the cells. Um, I'm gonna show you another chart here. So see the insulin right here on the left. It's a little bit of a triangle, purple triangle here. And see it as the, as the key for the cell to open the glucose channel. So the insulin is a key, and when the key enters the receptor for the insulin, then the glucose channel or the little opening in the cells opens and glucose can enter. So you can see it on the right side here, what happens, right? So the insulin unlocks actually the glucose channel. And if there is no insulin or lack of insulin, then the glucose channel stays closed, closed and uh, glucose cannot enter. Now I love to, you know me, I love to compare things to something that is a little easier to understand and uh, see the insulin as the hand that opens the basically the cap of the, of the fuel tank and the fuel that you basically <laughs> purchase at the gas station is the glucose, okay? It's the fuel for the cell. So if there's no one opening the cap, you cannot really refuel your car. If insulin is not opening the cap for the glucose to come in the cell, the cells will not be powered by glucose. The cells will not get the energy and that is really dangerous for the body. So if there is low glucose, if there is low glucose in the bloodstream and if there is high glucose in the cells, that is called hypoglycemic shock, where there's basically where the body does need a certain amount of sugar to operate. And if there's not enough sugar because we overdose insulin, that is also a problem, right? So there can be too extreme, too much blood sugar in the blood and not enough blood sugar in the blood. Now, uh, there's another hormone. And, and I think this is super important for you to understand that it's not just insulin that regulates the sugar in blood. It's glucagon that also helps. And it does the opposite, basically. Glucagon helps the liver to convert glycogen, which is a sugar or energy storage, into glucose. And if there is not enough glucagon, then there may not be enough glucose. Now, imagine that you're going for a marathon and you need to actually start converting glycogen to glucose. So your dog goes on a big hike. If there is not enough glucagon that is also produced by, by pancreas, then the glucose can, glycogen cannot be converted into glucose and there is not gonna be enough sugar. That happens when you go for a run and you know suddenly you feel really hungry and so on. If you don't have enough storage of uh, glycogen or you just basically have done really, really severe exercise, then you become hungry. And that's how the whole um, loop works basically. Insulin uh, absorbs the or allows the sugar to enter cells, and glucagon allows the liver to convert glycogen into glucose. And again, glycogen is the storage, is the supply, the storage for uh, energy. Now, as I said, most people would say that diabetes is genetic and genetically predisposed. But diet, immune system function, they also pay, play a big role. Um, if um, you think of, well, in practice, I've been in practice for 30 years and I, I have seen many, many dogs, many diabetic dogs. And there is one really interesting phenomenon that I've noticed, dogs that are on non-processed raw or cooked diet, very rarely get diabetes. And this is something that um, plays a key role in the prevention. If you think of uh, preventing any disease, we usually try to kind of figure out how to prevent it by looking at the people or animals who get it and who don't. So if we, if we know that, at least from practice, from 30 years of being in practice, if I know that diabetes almost never happens in dogs on, on non-processed food, then I would, be, I would start looking into the processed food. And when the processed food enters the body, 
it is actually, it is causing a lot of stress on the pancreas that cries for help. I'm going to start sharing screen again. So think about it this way. Our dog's pancreas evolved on diet of meat, plant material, and some bones. It is not designed, it has not evolved to digest complex carbohydrates. It doesn't have the equipment. It's almost as if you tried to make dolphin walk on the, on the dry land, or if you wanted turtle to run fast. The pancreas basically is not capable of digesting complex carbohydrates very well. So it's crying for help. And often we actually see dogs getting very severe pancreas inflammation, which we call pancreatitis. Sometimes it can be chronic as opposed to acute, which is very dangerous. And sometimes it can lead to um, uh, systemic shock and, and it can be a fatal condition. The chronic pancreatitis is almost like a smoldering condition that is not too severe and serious. But the body and the immune system registers this inflammation. Pancreatitis stands for inflammation of the pancreas. The body registers the inflammation because the pancreas gets overworked by digesting food that it's not designed for. And then it creates antibodies. So the body creates, the immune system creates antibodies against the cells of pancreas, including the cells that are producing the insulin. And what happens as the next kind of phase, the pancreas loses the cells because they're inflamed and then it stops producing enough insulin and insulin is the is the key for the lock to open the glucose entering the cells meaning that suddenly everything stops the energy metabolism is severely disturbed and it can be a very serious problem and sometimes fatal problem so the key here is to remember that if you do do you have a dog on processed food and you want to prevent diabetes in your dog you really have to consider and I'm saying it gently and, and with a you know, degree of understanding, you have to consider switch your dog to either cooked or raw food. If you're asking me whether it's okay to give dehydrated uh, grain-free food, probably better than the grain and carbohydrate-based food, but still dehydrated food takes much more time to digest and it's stressful on the pancreas. Also, high fats, like I sometimes get a question of coconut or about coconut oil, whether, whether it's good for, uh, for dogs or not. We see smoldering low-grade chronic pancreatitis in some dogs that get a lot of fatty meals, including coconut oil on a regular basis. Not saying that it's terrible for most dogs, but some dogs respond to it by, by reacting and responding in inflammation of the pancreas. So just remember that. And as our dogs age, they lose the ability to repair. They lose the ability to actually deal with, deal with inflammation, and it, it uh, leads to more serious problems. Um, diabetes in dogs can happen in any age. It right? can happen to young dogs or older dogs. It also can happen after an insult of multiple vaccines when we give you know, the initial vaccines to dogs. Um, there's sometimes 20-plus antigens going in the body within two months. And I do recommend you being very careful and using a safer vaccination protocol that we will post on our thread here in comments. So going back, we cannot really make the pancreas run fast, <laughs> digest, digest uh, carbohydrates, uh, similar to we can make dolphins to walk. They're really great swimmers. Pancreas of dogs is really good digesting proteins, but it is not um, good in digesting digesting carbohydrates. I just realized that I'm not sharing screen, so I'm just going to show you the, the slides that I wanted to show you. And uh, this is a lovely turtle that I collected um, from stock photography and, and I love dolphins, so why not a dolphin? So remember that at least how I understand diabetes, uh, it can be genetically predisposed, but the immune system plays a big role in most dogs with diabetes. If the antibodies against pancreas are created, then it leads to destruction of the cells and lack of production of insulin and diabetes. So 
the symptom of diabetes, they're not very specific with the exception of one, and that is elevated blood sugar. But increased thirst, urination, and appetite can be, a, you know, uh, for example, a symptom of Cushing's disease or kidney disease can also present uh, with these symptoms. Weight loss, inappetence, vomiting, uh, all those can be kidney disease or liver disease uh, issues. Um, so it's not very specific to diabetes. But if you do see dog, your dog uh, drinking too much and peeing too much and being hungry and losing weight, all you need to do, well, all you need to do, you have to go to see your veterinarian and, and run blood panel and make sure that you do not miss something. In the old days, and I'm not necessarily recommending it, but in the old days, I've heard that they used to taste the urine to see whether it's sweet. <laughs> if you are daring uh, and if you are, if you love to experiment, you can do so. I wouldn't do it myself personally. <laughs> it's just a little joke here. So uh, how do you determine that your dog is diabetic? Obviously, blood test is the most important part of the whole uh, equation and diagnostic process. And um, your veterinarian may have a very simple glucometer in the hospital where they can take a very quick uh, glucose test. And um, if it's, um, if it's, um, if it's more advanced test, then it's sent to the lab. Um, <laughs> I brought this picture <laughs> up because um, you can see that it has donuts here and sugar cubes. It's from the human um, human slideshow that uh, that I found. It's a stock uh, photography or picture. Um, obviously, even in humans, uh, too much sugar stresses the pancreas because it needs to produce more insulin. And as a result, it gets inflamed and it destroys the, and the immune system destroys the cells. So the principle is the same. In humans, we are a little better at digesting complex carbohydrates but we are definitely not built for donuts and sugar cubes and all the sweet stuff that we see in our grocery stores. Um, obviously sodas, uh, Coke, um, and all the other stuff that is uh, available as well is a primary cause of diabetes. So if someone tells me, if, uh, if I find a document that says diabetes cannot be prevented, I think it's just real wrong statement. <laughs> Sorry, I rarely say that something is wrong, but this is wrong. Okay, so um, how do you monitor a dog that has been diagnosed with diabetes? Um, you know, you can, you can um, monitor for the symptoms that I just mentioned, right? Like if you see that your dog gets, puts on, gets put on insulin injections or insulin administration, and I'll talk about it later, you can actually monitor these different symptoms and grade them. And the total, the maximum total here is 12. So if you see that your dog is doing fairly well, like you're somewhere around four or five, and you know you can kind of like um, take daily uh, count of, of these and, and see how your dog is doing. If you see that your dog is not losing weight and is not thirsty and the appetite is just, just for right and attitude and activity is right, then you're probably regulating your dog's diabetes very well. But I'm not going to suggest that you should be regulating your dog's diabetes on your own. There is another test beside glucose level, and that's fructosamine. And it gives you a time frame of two weeks uh, of changes of the blood glucose um, overall. So two week time capsule, I would say, uh, can be measured by fructosamine. Sometimes uh, veterinarians use this value if they cannot run more detailed tests in the clinic, but I will talk about how to measure the, the right dose of insulin and so on in a moment. So I know that there's a lot of information here, but I would like you to um, ask questions if you have any, and I'll answer them at the end. So the goal should be to give sufficient amount of insulin that lasts just the right amount of time without making the blood sugar dangerously low. Because while high blood sugar is not optimal and the cells and the body will starve of energy, if you overdose insulin, low blood sugar can be actually fatal. It can be very serious. You must work with your veterinarian very closely. And if you have a diabetic dog and you feel that the treatments are getting expensive and that you will do the regulation on your own, 
I would caution you not to do it. I also caution you to do all you can to prevent diabetes if your dog is healthy right now. If you're feeding kibble, I beg you, I beg you, please consider feeding proper food. And I'm saying proper food after 20 plus years of feeding raw and cooked natural diet. I have nothing to gain from this because I don't sell any food of, of, of raw or, or cooked nature. I don't sell any food and I don't associate it with any companies in a closer financial way. I may have helped some companies to formulate um, their recipes, but I do not have any financial gains from what I'm saying here. So um, work with your vet and also learn as much as you can. Now, there are several, I'm just going to mention a little bit about different types of insulin. Uh, because if you know and understand them, you may be able to ask your veterinarian to reduce the cost of uh, insulin treatment because some of them are more or less expensive. Now, most people remember, or if you had a diabetic dog, you may be using injections, but there are also insulin pens available and uh, make sure that you store insulin properly, um, that um, you will store it in the fridge. But if you leave it out of the fridge for a couple of hours in, on one occasion or two occasions, it's going to be still fine. So if someone tells you, hey, throw it out because you left it out of the fridge for two or four or five hours, it should be okay. It should be stored in the fridge, but it is not going to go bad after one or two incidents. Uh, there are several different types of insulin. Uh, some of them are given once a day. Some of them are given twice a day. I'm not going to go into the detail about that. The vet insulin is canine-specific insulin. It actually is uh, porcine or pig-based pig insulin. And it is actually exactly the same. The molecule is exactly the same as in dogs. NPH is, uh, is another insulin that is a little less expensive. And then there are some other uh, forms. So, uh, you know, talk to your veterinarian about the cost and your veterinarian will give you a sense how to start um, the insulin, how to administer it, and also how to measure it. Now, the measurements, the monitoring, uh, can be done by, as I said, glucometer, which is this little simple device. It comes in different forms. And um, um, it's, it requires blood collection. So some dogs don't really like to be poked. Uh, if we monitor the effectiveness of uh, glu insulin treatment, we sometimes need to keep our dogs um, in the hospital uh, for 12 or more hours. And obviously they get stressed and it's not optimal. So there's a company that came with um, a glucometer, which is actually really cool. It can be attached to the skin of your dog for a period of two weeks. And then you can get a really good idea if you are regulating the diabetes, the diabetes properly or not. Because this little device, and I'll show you in a moment, is connected to a mobile phone. So you can measure actually the glucose levels from the skin, not from blood, but from the skin every single minute. Isn't that amazing? Now I'm going to show you how it's done. Um, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to just move a little along. So so here we have this little um, you can see so there's a little chip at the end and they kind of prepare it and there's a little sensor in there and actually the sensor is inside so you can see that there's a sensor uh, that then gets attached to the skin glued to the skin of the dog and uh, you can take your dog home and don't need to stress them. So here they're attaching the little sensor. Um, I will play it again. This is a YouTube video. I just, I'm just sharing it from YouTube. Oh, poor little pooch. I would probably choose to do this if there was an option. You can ask your veterinarian if you have a diabetic dog. Um, it does stay glued to the skin for, um, for two weeks, and then you just cover it with a bandage or t-shirt and your dog can go home 
<laughs> and they get used to it. You know, the sensors, obviously, you know, if you can choose to prevent your dog from getting di becoming diabetic, and you can in most cases, then that's option number one. If your dog becomes diabetic and you need to stress it in a hospital to take glucose curve or take it home and being able to actually see what the glucose level is for two weeks and then regulate and adjust the doses and then you can remove the sensor and then for several months uh, they can go without it right and then again depending whether the symptoms increase or not whether your scale and the point values increase or decrease you can call your vet and say hey you know i think that my dog is drinking a little too much uh, we need to do another curve and see what's going on now, remember that sometimes infections and other underlying condition can cause a problem. Um, type of food will also change the, in, the insulin requirements. If you have your dog on kibble and suddenly switch to raw or cooked food, that will decrease the insulin requirements and you will need to adjust to make sure that your dog does not get hypoglycemic or will not have low blood sugar. So, um, I know that I've been talking about prevention versus treatment, but honestly, preventing any disease and be proactive in healthcare is the best way to go. You know, proactive approach to a problem can be compared to teaching kids swimming, right? To prevent them from drowning. I go to swim to this lake that is a flooded mine. And about three months ago, there was a fatality. A little boy fell in and he died. And there are two options, right? To prevent these tragedies from happening, we teach our kids swimming as early as possible. Or we can decide that we put 100 lifeguards by the lake, which is basically how we approach medicine. We talk about how to treat diseases, how to rescue people when they're drowning in quotes in the disease. I find it very frustrating that our politicians often talk about how much money they're gonna spend on healthcare while almost none of them talk about preventing disease. You know, there will be so much money saved if people and animals were actually, if we focus on prevention. But we are in a reactive world of medicine and we are always talking about how much money we are going to spend on treating certain problems or what drugs we are going to develop to treat certain problems. And we are not teaching people how to swim in life, how to swim in preventing diseases, uh, if you understand what I mean. I know that this is a little weird comparison or analogy, but we need to learn how to swim. I'm basically doing nothing else than learning, teaching you how to, how to swim. Yeah, we can get the guards and some people may like the guards because they're so good looking, but in, a, in, in the real world, teaching people how to swim teaching ourselves and learning learning how to prevent disease is the most important part please remember that it is much easier to prevent 80 percent of the conditions out there of course like if a dog breaks a leg or something like that or if there is a sharp glass and, and your dog steps on uh, on a sharp glass and cuts foot uh, cuts his foot that's a different situation but uh, we need to really stop treating reactively as often as we can. So um, I did disable my phone and it still rings. Uh, it seems that today is a, is a challenging day, but we are going with the flow. Um, I want to talk a little bit about special veterinary kibble. It happens often that when a dog is diagnosed with diabetes, my colleagues recommend special veterinary diets. And I don't blame them because they were taught to recommend special veterinary diets. But when you look at the recipes, and this is one of the copy of the recipes, you will see a lot of complex carbohydrates, whole grain, corn, 
powdered cellulose is actually wood chips, corn gluten meal, another carb, chicken liver flavor, chicken byproduct meal, soy bean meal run, chicken dried beet pulp soy. Out of these ingredients, more than half, I would say roughly about 60%, and probably more than that because these upper ones are in greater volume, uh, are carbohydrates. This is special veterinary kibble for treating diabetes, hey guys. I have no idea how this happened. I have no idea. I, I often just kind of, <laughs> my, my mind is busy and I often think of, I, I, I would love to talk to these people who formulate these diets. I say, you guys, so, so what's going on? Like you call yourself specialists and you're ignoring basic evolutionary capacity of our dogs. You forgot that our dogs have evolved differently. And, and, and you know, a few thousand years of, of living with people have, has not changed our dog's pancreas makeup. It is still the same pancreas as it was a few thousand years ago before dogs started living with us. And if somebody, someone says, well, but you know, there are different breeds and they have different, different, um, different um, capacity. No, they don't. Because if you put a pancreas of a Chihuahua and a Great, great Dane under a microscope, it's going to be exactly the same, the same architecture. There's going to be zero difference. The pathologist will not recognize if it's from a Chihuahua or Great Dane. So what do we do? Well, um, I have, <laughs> my team and I have put a lot of effort into teaching people how to create better diet, how to make better food for their dogs. Uh, there's a healthy recipe maker for dogs that we have on our website, and I'm going to show it to you. Um, it's a really cool tool. And if you have not seen it, I would recommend you using it. It basically, let's see if we can click on it. Oh, we can't, oh, there may be a link. There you go. <laughs> And I'm going to share the screen one more time. Alicia, am I sharing screen, the whole screen or just? Yes, I can see the recipe maker. It looks like you're on the protein page. Okay. Oh, I see. So you're not seeing what I'm sharing actually now. So I'm going to share something different. All right. Uh, so this is the recipe maker. You click start. Uh, you basically start choosing the different proteins. You can learn about them which one are good. You can see mackerel is actually yellow. I don't like mackerel because it's really high in mercury. Um, I don't like feeding fish often because it's high in mercury. Um, you can see that we actually, um, we have some notes about sardines as well. I will not tell you more because I'd like you to go and explore, 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 and it'll teach you how to make raw diet. And it has a lot of information how to, how to choose the bones and how to choose the organs. By the way, I would not stress about feeding organs if you do give essential supplements because sometimes it's difficult to get them. And I don't want you to feed just liver because you can actually overdose liver and uh, cause liver toxicity and vitamin A overdose. So uh, this is Recipe Maker. Um, you can find it at um, recipemaker.peterdebias.com. And I'm going to actually show you the URL here. One more time, it is right here, can you see it? <laughs> All right, um, so the next thing I'd like to show you is uh, the frequency or talk about the frequency of, of feeding because you will ask, how often do I feed my dog? Well, if you feed your dog that does not have diabetes, it's always much better to feed only once a day because intermittent fasting for dogs has proven to be good for them. It activates uh, longevity enzymes and genes and uh, fasting for dogs is super good and healthy. If you have a diabetic dog, usually we feed twice a day. So that's a difference because of the insulin curve and how we need to handle diabetic dogs. The amount, again, is by or, or within the recipe maker. So you can go to the recipe maker. But I'll give you one little example. If my dog is 50 pounds, I will start roughly with about 500 grams of food, which is about 1.2 pounds or 1.1 pounds. 
And uh, if you have a really highly active dog, you feed um, double the amount. Pax is, for example, about 55 pounds and he gets a kilo or over two pounds of food. Um, how uh, often I talked about it um, once, uh, once a day in non-diabetic dog and uh, twice a day in diabetic dog. Body weight is super important. If you're trying to make your dog lose some weight, you can use this chart, which is again within the recipe maker. It's, it's such a handy tool, you guys. Share it, um, use it, um, share recipes with us, share recipes with other people, post them, let people know, because this tool can really save many dogs from getting sick. Now, if you want your dog to be optimal, ideal, healthy weight, you um, use this chart and you can click on these bubbles. Right now, I don't have the live version, but you can click on these bubbles within the recipe maker and it'll tell you exactly the description of uh, what your dog should look like. Um, I usually say you should be able to feel the ribs, but you should not see them. You don't see them, but if you count the ribs on this particular dog, the colored one, um, you will uh, feel them. The backbone is nice and round and the, and the hips are really nice and muscled. You can see in the, in the chunky dog here that unlikely we'll be able to count the ribs. And this dog is, looks a little bit more like a night table than a healthy dog <laughs> with four legs. Uh, some dogs, I've seen some dogs that look like a night table and it's really sad because often they're the ones who get diabetes. So I talk about supplements a lot and you guys know that I have formulated a supplement line for dogs and now for humans. I formulated the lines because I truly believe that we are in trouble when it comes to essential nutrients uh, from food. Um, in the ideal world, and you see the ideal world on this slide in African savanna, the soul's get replenished by everything that rises from it and gets back to the soul, from the grass to the herbivores to the carnivores, it all returns eventually to soil. And there is a recycling of nutrients, but guess what happens with our food? It either ends up in a very different location that it originated from, um, or it ends up in the garbage and there is no recycling of nutrients. And the soil does not have the ability to renew as fast as we use it. So our nutrients and our food is severely depleted. And if you don't have, if you don't have food that is um, nutritious, then the body will falter. And that's how disease actually happens. When the building blocks are missing, one of the causes of disease is exactly that. Um, I often have discussions with people about recycling food and at least composting, even though if you get tomatoes from California and you live up in Canada, you will not be able to ship the compost back to California. Ideally, we should be doing that. But because the world is too complex, at least compost it and put it in your garden so you don't waste the most precious resources around. Fabulous four. These are the four essentials that I take, that I give to my dog, that I recommend to you. The reviews are real. You can click on the website if you wish. And um, just to give you a real quick um, outline of what these are, uh, minerals and amino acids for ingredient, fermented multivitamin and soul food and organ support. We have turmeric and some other ingredients in that to support organs and infl decrease inflammation. Probiotics, super important for the immune system if you want to prevent, um, if you want to prevent diabetes, it's super important to have a healthy immune system and healthy immune system depends on digestion. So gut sense is probiotics, but it's also an immune support. And filbert omega reduces inflammation. And you know what I, um, what I really love about filbert omega, that it's clearly noticeably reduces inflammation. And we know that inflammation is precursor of premature aging and precursor of cancer. So if we want to reduce, if we want to prevent the, uh, you know, premature aging and, um, and slow it down and reduce the, the rates of cancer, 
uh, we do need to give Omega. You know, Pax is busy. And yesterday he just go, got rolled over by a Great Dane in the park. You know, they're playing and I'm going, oh my goodness, this dog is huge. And suddenly he's tumbling, right? So immediately I actually give him double dose of feel good Omega because I know that he probably pulled a muscle or something. And, you know, he always recovers, even if he does tumble. And um, I take feel good Omega uh, in the human form, which is called feel good Omega, sorry, feel good H plus. So the, the human line is called H plus. Now I'm gonna show you the page with the essentials. So you can learn much more and you can even figure out Okay, I'm gonna put, um, I'm gonna choose pounds and I'm gonna put Pax's weight, which is about 55 pounds. And I want to, oh, you're not seeing anything. <laughs> Sorry, Alicia, you have to tell me. <laughs> yeah, the share screen was there and then it just disappeared a few seconds ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There so, we go. Uh, this is the, the page where you can actually, um, where you can see the essentials and I'm putting in 55 pound dog supp supply and uh, I will get the complete pack and it'll tell me, it'll tell me um, what I need. See, so it actually gave me, so if I need, if I need for one month uh, supply and it'll actually last longer, but I need minimum of these, these four. If you have a great day and it'll come up with different quantities. Also, um, the other benefit is that if you, um, if you buy multiples of either one product or several products of different kind, you get 15% discount and the system is automated. So forgive me to show you um, this uh, practically. Um, obviously, we are in business uh, of, of helping you and also selling the supplements because they not only make a difference, but they also help us to carry the um, the, the financial burden of the teaching and, and organizing and uh, creating courses and, and also helping many dog lovers that email us every day and we give them answers about any conditions for free, no matter whether they're our customers or not. So thank you so much for being part of the mission and making such a difference in the lives of not only your dog, but also other dogs. So going back to my slideshow, I would like to talk a little bit more about hair testing. Um, you know, there are certain minerals that are important in, in uh, production of insulin. And one of them is zinc, for example. And, and another one is chromium. Um, hair key test is a hair test that is really inexpensive in the big scheme of things in comparison with other blood tests that are available there. So hair testing will give you a really good idea what the levels of different minerals in your dog's body are or have been in the course of the past four months. You know, if you take blood tests and you actually analyze some of the minerals, it gives you a snapshot. The uh, body can be depleted, but the blood levels still can be normal. It's almost like, you know, you have food on the table, but the fridge is empty, right? So that, that would be the same analogy. So if you have any minerals that are low, and you can see that, that there is a very good example here, um, then it'll show on the hair key test. And hair key test also gives you um, toxin levels um, in the body, mercury, arsenic, lead, and others. Uh, there's also a video on uh, hair key test and can give you a little more information. And you can see people like the product. It's actually a very simple, um, form that will send you and you send us hair sample and we'll analyze it and we'll send you results. So it's super fast and uh, efficient when it comes to submission of the results. So uh, going back to another really important part of treating, but also preventing diabetes. And that is your dog's spine. You know, I love, I just recently, about a week ago, I talked to my colleague and friend, Dr. Becker, and uh, we have a podcast that I would highly recommend you listening to. But we were kind of talking about him, how embarrassingly simple most problems in medicine are when it comes to their prevention. You know, it's not rocket science. You can prevent really honestly large majority of your dog's problems, if you know how. And one of the ways of preventing diabetes 
beside good diet and, and, and stopping kibble is to actually look after your dog's spine. And the point at your dog's spine, right behind the last strip, is responsible for energy flow to the pancreas and the stomach. And if that particular area is injured or tight, or your dog slips or slides and injures this particular area, it will eventually lead to compromised stomach and pancreas. Sometimes- Dr. Tobias, sorry to interrupt. Um, the slide is not showing up. If you could try maybe re-sharing. Okay. Thank you. All right. Great, um, yes, we see it now. So this is the last, uh, this is somewhere the, la the area of the last strip. And so if you track the last strip right here, you'll feel it because you can actually kind of, you can feel the last strip of your dog unless he looks like a, or she or he looks like a night table, then you know what to do, reduce the food, get off kibble. Um, going back to this. Um, so the pancreas and stomach points are right here. And if there is spasm or injury or inflammation in that area, it will affect the pancreas and it may lead to diabetes. It may lead to stomach bloats as well. The point is common for those two organs. Uh, so what do you do? Well, check your dog's spine. If your dog is twitching right behind the last strip, you want to give them a good massage. You want to go and see chiropractor, physical therapist, acu acupuncturist, veterinarian who's got an understanding of spinal energy flow and alignment. And make sure that you don't go just once, but you go as often as needed to prevent these spasms from being present. So we are at the end of our, um, we are at the end of our slideshow. I would like to actually ask if you have any questions and um, we'll go from there. Thank you. We have a couple of community questions. Uh, the first is from Susan. Susan asks, can they do an A1C test on dogs like humans? Would make sense to see the average. Is that something you're familiar with? A1C test, I have no idea what it is. Uh, is it possible that it is, uh, well, let me just look it up. A1C test. <laughs> uh, t -t 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 self check. You know, uh, you know, I, I have seen no reference in veterinary medicine to A1C test, and I would have to figure out whether that's available or not. I'm not able to give you the answer right away. But as far as I know, it is not available. Let me just let me just do one more check. A1C1 test for dogs. <laughs> Why not? Uh, very interesting uh, that there is um, there is you know it's so interesting that it's not mentioned in uh, even at, at veterinary information network, which is pretty much the you know, the place to go for any information. So I will read about it. I will learn about it. And uh, I, I do have a feeling maybe it is fructosamine test, but I'm not 100% sure. So I'll have to actually, I'll have to have a look and go from there. Sorry, I can't answer right away. I'm sorry, I do not know. <laughs> uh, um, anyway, thank you so much for the question. I love to be challenged. And I love the opportunity to say, hey, I don't really know but I will find out. Um, it is actually super, super common for us veterinarians to look things up because there's so much information, but you don't really see that as often as we do <laughs> from the other side. All Thank right. you. And the next quest is, sorry, the next question is from Alessi. Dr. Tobias, if a dog has diabetes, is there, and sorry, if a dog has diabetes and is on insulin along with losing sight, is there anything to help slow down the process of sight loss? Um, you know, I think that the most important part of slowing down the sight loss is actually to regulate diabetes well. So if, you know, if there is any space in that area, obviously diet and nutrition and uh, maybe even given some of the, you know, some of the, I specific supplements, um, but I, 
you know, I think that regulating diabetes is actually the most important part. I, I wish I had a better answer for you. Uh, if you're feeding kibble, please, um, am I muted? No, I'm not muted. Looks like, okay. If I'm feeding kibble, sorry, if, you, if you're feeding kibble, please switch. You know why I'm stumbling here? Because I'm seeing my name, Peter Device, and muted a microphone, and I'm realizing that Alicia is uh, pretending to be me. <laughs> Alicia. <laughs> I have switched that over. Thank you for letting me know. I, uh, I joined Zoom very quickly and forgot to switch it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just so entertained by the chaotic nature of this podcast or this uh, Facebook Live. It's so it's funny. It's been a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's one of those days, but it's okay. You guys, I hope you'll learn what you need to learn. And uh, we have another question that comes up super often um, is to do with diet. The main question that we hear from dog lovers is what sort of special diet should I give my dog if they have diabetes? I know we talked about diet earlier, but can you revisit this super important topic? Because as you said, prevention is key. And I think this really needs to be reiterated. Yeah, um, basically, um, the diet that you should be feeding is um, listed on the recipe maker, but I'll give you a summary. I usually feed about... Um, I feed about 50% meat roughly, 75% of edible bones and the rest vegetables. And I would be giving more leafy greens and less carby vegetables like squashes and pumpkins. But you can still add some, but do not add too many. And uh, that's basically, it's, it's relatively simple. A lot of variety, um, a lot of uh, attention to switching the meats and uh, do not be afraid of feeding bones. Um, it's not <laughs> today. We don't have the time to talk about diet more, more in detail, but I would not, you know, the, the thing is that diabetes can be prevented and also treated by species appropriate diet. Look what dogs eat in nature and try to emulate that. I know that there are a few different versions or opinions about what dogs should be eating, whether it's meat and bones with no vegetables or vegetables and uh, meat and bones. I like feeding vegetables. I've seen dogs doing better on it, many dogs, and some dogs don't. So again, you have to just kind of decide for yourself. Uh, Dr. Becker and I were talking about that too, that it is not about who is right or who is wrong, but what works for your dog. And, and, and the variance and variation is not that huge. It's still better if you feed any kind of raw diet than uh, feeding kibble, as long as it's balanced and as long as it's based in either long time expertise or research. And in diet, in raw diet, you know, most of us really stem from years and decades of, of experience. And it shouldn't be underestimated. If I know that dogs look better on raw diet when I, when I see them in practice for 20 years, 20 plus years, 30 years, I think it counts for something and I don't really need to spend hundreds and millions of hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to actually prove that it's pretty clear. You'd be probably surprised if someone was feeding a horse a steak and we are feeding our dogs basically grain and, and wood chips and cornmeal and soy gluten like hello. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of ridiculous. And yet so prevalent, unfortunately, um, so many people are still feeding because the kibble industry is so big, but gradually we're seeing a little shift. It's big, you guys. It's not going to start with them. It's going to start with you. Um, and it started with you. And, you know, they're trying, but they're still making the same. Most of them make the same horrible diet that is not species appropriate. Mm -hmm. Speaking I of so species... would love to have a friendly discussion. I don't even, I'm not even angry with those people who produce these foods but I, I just would like to have a really honest you know conversation maybe have a have a glass of wine and say so listen like you know off the record what's going on can you tell me how you feel can you tell me how you feel about doing this and maybe some of them would say well I believe that this is the best thing to do and I'd say, okay, you know, I understand, but I'm sure that some people go, man, like I need to pay my mortgage and I need to have a paycheck and I didn't find another job. Well, I don't think that's really true. Like if you, 
if you want to quit from a pet food company, <laughs> maybe, maybe we have a job for you, if you're honest. <laughs> a little oh, bit of incentive. What did I do now? We'll have all these spies with no company. <laughs> um, speaking of species-appropriate diets, have you ever seen a dog that is being fed a species-appropriate, natural, wholesome diet have diabetes during your time in veterinary clinics? This is such a good question because I haven't. I haven't seen one single dog that would start on raw diet and would be on raw diet and, and got diabetic. And this is, this is why I actually am convinced that it can be prevented. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the diabetes is not going to happen in some sort of unfortunate dog. But it is really clear that, um, that it's preventable. And that's the good news. We should not be waiting until it happens. Remember the teachers who teach kids swimming or the guards who would have to be there. Proactive medicine is teaching people how to prevent disease in their dogs and themselves. So tragedies don't happen, right? Because we can never put enough guards to actually solve all the problems before it's too late. And that happened in the, in the lake that I go to swim to, right? It's really awful, actually. I, I, you know, and, and being a veterinarian who is interested in prevention and proactive medicine feels like seeing dogs being drowned every day. And the only thing that I can do is to actually spend pretty much, you know, hopefully many, many years in the future to teach you how to prevent these problems how to teach you swim in the lake of medicine and sometimes swamp of medicine. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't be using the, the term swamp because I'm, I don't want to be political here, but <laughs> it, it really is, is important for you to remember this. And the last question that we have is to do with the sensor that was shown being attached to the dog in the video that you showed us earlier. Do you know how comfortable or uncomfortable that is for the dog? Um, it looked like the dog was still awake while it was attached. So I assume it's a fairly easy yeah. process and maybe, you know, not super painful for the dog. No, I, I think that what they do, they actually use uh, some sort of form of glue, a tissue glue. And uh, as the skin kind of grows off and the hair grows up, uh, it peels off. And I, I do know that the skin receptors, you know, try to put your finger on your hand after a while, you won't even feel it, right? Like if you wear earrings, do you know that they're there? So the skin sensors get kind of dull and they don't, I think that dogs get used to it. The same way we get used to wearing, uh, you know, watches and uh, jewelry or whatever, earrings, um, hat that I wear often. I don't really feel my hats. <laughs> Thank you. That was the last question, but what a great, I don't know, an important topic. Hopefully as time progresses, less and less dogs will have diabetes and be faced with this issue because more and more people will be feeding a natural, wholesome, species appropriate diet. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you everyone for watching. And if you have not subscribed to our, our community, please do so at peterdubais.com. We publish a lot of information on how to help your dog, but also about human health and also about emotional and mental health now, because that's so, super important. Uh, there is a, there's a new product to be launched. I actually will tell you, it's already launched. <laughs> but we are launching it officially on Saturday. It's Soul Food H+, Plus, uh, which is fermented uh, multivitamin for humans. I'm super proud of my team to help to launch the fourth product in our human line. For those of you who are wondering, what, what, what am I doing launching human products? Well, I've been interested in nutrition in general since I was in my 20s. And, and I, um, I would like to share what I've learned. And, you know, vitamins and minerals and all that stuff, it's pretty similar. And especially if you have 30 plus years of reading and studying on uh, human nutrition as well, it's relatively simple. But we also have had a human formulator, expert formulator, making sure everything is fine. Um, we had many people taking our animal products, our dog products, so we just finally decided to launch it. And also it's capsulated, um, so it's easier. And it's made in the same production facility in the US. It's, uh, it has no Chinese ingredients, 
and it's fermented and the fermentation increases um, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer capacity. It has organ support as well, some turmeric and some other ingredients to support kidneys and liver. Um, yeah, I, I'm really happy about it. So check it out. It's soulfood-h.com. And thank you so much. Take care. Have a wonderful day. And I have an evening now. I'm still in Europe and will be here until maybe for month, one more month. And then I'll be heading, heading west. Take care, you guys. Bye-bye. Cheers.